Hello, and welcome to the Justin Center Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper. Thank you so much for joining me on the program once again today. Um, And as always, I want to give you all a reminder that Justin Center as an organization is supported by donors. So you can go to justincenter.org, go to our donate page and help us out with all the things that we do uh, in our mission to educate the church and the world. So um, I, on the program today, I'm going to be talking about uh, the theology of Gerhard Ferdi and radical Lutheranism. And the reason I'm doing this right now uh, is because I uh, recently... um, was asked by Issues Etc. to uh, speak about the new cat- large catechism published by Concordia Publishing House. And those of you who are not uh, familiar with the, with this controversy uh, and debate that that happened, uh, basically the, the Concordia Publishing House put out a, a new edition of Luther's Catechism that has a series of essays. Uh, there was a lot of pushback about some of the authors and some of the content of the essays. And one of the points of pushback was that Stephen Paulson wrote uh, one of the essays. Now, uh, Stephen Paulson is a theologian in the ELCA, and someone had told me that he left the ELCA recently, and I don't know that that's true because I had asked somebody else uh, who seemed to know, and they said the opposite, so I don't know. <laughs> so so maybe he's not anymore. I, re- I really don't know, and I haven't tracked that down. So uh, at least until recently was in the ELCA, and maybe he's not anymore. Um, uh, but uh, the, the pushback was because of his, you know, his theological stances differ in pretty significant ways from the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And since then, I have had people ask, why don't you do a program on Stephen Paulson to delve into some of those issues more in depth? Uh, and then other people say, why don't you delve into the question of radical Lutheranism? My initial response to all of these is, I've dealt with that stuff for years, so why the heck do I need to go into it again? Haven't I said enough? Uh, and then I realize that as I go through my, <laughs> so I went through my YouTube videos and realized like, okay, I actually did a lot on this like 10 years ago on an audio podcast and you can find those old episodes, but like, there's not a lot on, on YouTube. It's something that took a large period of time for me and was a significant area of, of focus, uh, of, of mine for some time. Um, but I've, I've kind of moved away from really much of a concern with those issues in, in more recent times. Not that I don't see them as, as issues, but I, my own study has just been focused on some other things. Um, but uh, I realized, ah, okay, maybe I should actually go back and do some more of this. If you really want a treatment of this, of mine, um, I would recommend books that I've written on the subject. So uh, I, I wrote uh, Lex Eterna, which is a defense of, of the Orthodox Lutheran Doctrine of God's Law and Critique of Gerhard Ferdi. That was a master's thesis that I wrote and that, that became a book. That was the groundwork for then what became my my dissertation, which then was edited into another book, which is my prolegomena and my uh, contemporary Protestant scholastic theology series. And and that's not just a critique of, of Ferdi, neither of those are, uh, but Ferdi is, uh, Ferdi and the radical Lutherans in general uh, become the kind of, they're the point that I'm critiquing to argue for the necessity of the classical categories. So I'm trying to show the inadequacy of those thinkers uh, and to, to use that as an example to say, here is where we really go off the rails when we depart from from our classical tradition. So that's that's one example. And it's not the only example. So the most recent book of the, that I wrote that's currently um, being edited, so it's, it's going to be released this year, is on the doctrine of God. So in there, I deal more with uh, Carl Broughton and Robert Jensen, uh, Wolfhard Pannenberg and Jürgen Moltmann. So not radical Lutheran thinkers at all, but also another group of thinkers who have borrowed in some ways from Hegelian ideas. Uh, and there's more nuance to it than just a, a repackaging of Hegel, uh, but uh, uh, who depart from – rather than the radical Lutherans, thankfully, they don't depart from metaphysics altogether uh, – but they have a very different kind of metaphysic uh, that I think is more, in some ways, influenced by a kind of process theology, though not in the same form as Whitehead. But nonetheless, uh, m- my point is, when I defend a you know classical Lutheran orthodoxy, my, my primary concern is the defense of classical Lutheran orthodoxy, uh, rather than a critique of this or that movement. So radical Lutheranism is is one movement where I think you see a lot of the problems that arise when you depart from that classical approach. My my focus has moved certainly from uh, critique of movements like radical Lutheranism to wanting the heart of my theology and writing to really be a positive construal of of what a Lutheran Orthodox theology is. But any positive construal of theology needs needs some polemics as well, 
and in some some challenges, uh, and, and you need to push back. So uh, radical Lutheranism, I think, is a great example of why Lutheran orthodoxy matters, why classical metaphysical categories matter, why participation matters, uh, why uh, we, we should go back to older sources on a lot of these, these issues. Uh, all right, so... Uh, and yeah, I know a lot of people consider me kind of a, you know, classicist who's just stuck in the past in the 17th century or something. Uh, and, you know, maybe I am. I don't know that that's necessarily always a bad thing, but um, <laughs> I, I do think that uh, my goal is never just to say pure repristination. Um, but I think the foundations that we have there uh, really are what we need to build on. And I think that we took a, a significantly wrong turn when... Uh, some of the assumptions, especially of Kant and and, and the Enlightenment, and sp particularly their approach to nominalism and, and just kind of adherence and, and acceptance of nominalism without too much challenge, uh, was was really a mistaken one. And we could even go back further to the medieval nominalists and Occam and whatnot. Um, though I will say Occam, there are some good things in Occam as well, but nominalism as a whole. I do tend to blame for a lot of our current uh, societal ills and theological problems as well. So I'm no I'm no fan of nominalism. Um, all right. So what I'm going to do here is go through one book of the person who started radical Lutheranism, and that is Gerhard Ferdi. So you may be asking, well, why am I jumping to Paul from Paulson to Ferdi? You can't critique Paulson by talking about the theology of somebody totally different. <laughs> And okay, that's fair. They're not the same thinker, uh, but by any means, uh, and, and they, they do differ in significant ways. Um, but Ferdi, the reason I think we need to start with Ferdi is, first of all, Ferdi is a major influence on Paulson. Uh, doesn't mean that everything Ferdi says we need to attribute to Paulson because that's not that's just not fair. Um, but but I think a lot of the the questions, conversation, discussion that we find in Ferdi do lay the groundwork for what uh, develops in a lot of other Lutheran thinkers following Ferdi. I mean, Ferdi is, is, is highly influential, and he is influential not just in, not just at, you know, Luther Seminary, which is where Paulson uh, was teaching, and he had a significant uh, influence on, on thinkers there, but he also has a significant influence on, um, you know, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Uh, whether wh whether you want that to be the case or not, it is just just a fact. I know that uh, some of his his texts are assigned are assigned readings. Um, you know, there there are a number of of uh, professors at both Concordia seminaries that use Ferdi and and are significantly influenced by by him. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that they agree with him on every single thing. And so when I'm going through his critiques or my critiques of Ferdi, I'm not saying everyone that ever cites Ferdi positively believes all of the things that I'm talking about. Um, but I do think that it is really essential as we're evaluating a thinker like Ferdi uh, and looking at his influence to get at some of the really primary fundamental issues. And, and there are valid questions that need to be asked about, you know, he has errors in these really significant areas. Do those errors bleed over into some of the areas where he does have influence in positive ways among, you know, say, confessional Lutherans? So what, what I think is – because sometimes people, you know, I'll critique Ferdi and people will say, well, he's good on this and not good on that. Are you saying that you have to – a theologian has to be right on everything to use them? I mean, clearly I don't think that's the case because I use theologians all the time who I disagree with on even pretty significant points. Um, however, I will say the, the thing with Ferdi – that I think differentiates him from, you know, say, you know, say if I'm using Thomas Aquinas, right? And, and I, there is a lot I love in Thomas Aquinas. But when you get to questions of the papacy and penance and uh, a lot of the problems with medieval Roman Catholicism, I have very strong disagreements with Thomas Aquinas. So does that mean, because I disagree with him on those very important issues, that I find him useless? No, not at all. I think on issues of natural theology and the doctrine of God, uh, Aquinas is, is among the best there is. So I, I'm okay with that. But I think that the, the question with someone like a Gerhard Ferdi, which is something I think that should be asked in general, is, is their theological starting point and their entire theological program on wrong grounds? <laughs> and if you're starting on wrong grounds and you're, the entirety of your project is wrong, well, then you got to start to kind of question how much can be used. Because if, if your starting point is wrong uh, on, in such a profound way, then especially in a way that that's going to influence everything else you say, 
then you have to, I think, be a lot more skeptical of, of somebody's work and usefulness. So my argument is someone like Gerhard Ferdi, you know, if you read his foundational ideas, the driving force of his theology really is a dismissal of the classical Lutheran Orthodox doctrine of the law. Almost everything he says is that. And, and I would say the same about Paulson as well. Uh, when you read Paulson's you know, volumes on the outlaw God, I'm currently reading through the second volume there. I'm about halfway through it, and I hadn't read the second volume. I read the first one right when it came out. But because this hasn't been my area of focus recently, you know, it, it hasn't been something I've read. But now that I've been asked to you know, look at this, I, I, I've started to, to read more of his, his newer publications. But, well, what's the title? God saves the outlaw God because God is one who saves without any law at all. Well, that could sound Lutheran, and that's the phrase you'll see over and over again. But the question is, is it really Lutheran or is he really borrowing from what Ferdy's doing with his ladder scheme? And I think that's exactly what Paulson is doing. Some of it is is obfuscatory on purpose. Uh, it, it's it's vague on purpose, I think, to, to make it a little frustrating. But, but Ferdy's pretty straightforward. So with all of that, I'm going to start actually delving into what Ferdy says in this book, Where God Meets Man. Now, uh, Ferdy has a number of, of books that he's written uh, that are pretty popular. His most popular is his I'm um, Being a Theologian of the Cross, which is an evaluation of the Heidelberg Disputation of Luther. Very, very popular book. I understand why it's popular, because most of it is a reiteration of what Luther says in the Heidelberg Disputation. And, you know, the Heidelberg Disputation is, is useful. It, it, it's a helpful series of theses. But I also think it's been quite abused. But that's kind of a, a separate topic. Um, Luther uses the theologian of the cross, theologian of glory distinction there, which has basically no bearing whatsoever on Luther's later theology, which is, is certainly a point worth considering. That doesn't mean I find it useless, by the way. Um, but I do think that when you make it the paradigmatic uh, kind of schema to interpret all Lutheran theology... It, it's got some issues if you're saying, well, this is the most important distinction that Lutheranism has, and it's one that Luther never talked about later, and Lutheranism has never talked about in its history really until the mid-20th century when uh, Walter von Leeuwenhoek released his book, which is a good – I have disagreements with that book as well, but it's a good treatment of the subject. And I think McGrath – Alistair McGrath has another book on the topic um, – so, uh, so there, there are issues with, with that distinction. But Gerhard Ferdi's book, uh, Being a Theologian of the Cross, some of it's very useful. It's a book that I've seen people read and, and come to Lutheranism because they've read that book. Uh, and, and to some extent, I get it because there is some good, there, there's some good material in there. And, and some of it is just a reiteration of Luther. Um, but there are some significant problems in that book as well, though they are problems that I don't think the average reader would pick up on probably, unless you had read other Ferdy and you kind of see what he's getting at by certain arguments or certain kind of little swipes at different theologies that start to show up. Um, so what I want to do is go through then another book of Ferdy's. That's the one that people usually know. This is a very short book. It's called Where God Meets Man. It is, you know, it's a hundred, look, 128 pages, very short. If you want a good overview of Ferdy's theology and, and the problems in Ferdy's theology, this is a great place to go. Now, he has a, his book, The Law Gospel Debate, uh, which I have over here. I could go through plenty of sections of that. Um, that is a more academic uh, book dealing with the question of law and how law the law relates to the gospel. Um, and it, it, it is a very helpful resource in understanding where Ferdy is coming from academically and intellectually. And he's very blunt about certain things there that I think are very helpful for, for one who's really delved into Lutheran orthodoxy to see, because he's very, very critical of Luther, extremely critical of Lutheran orthodoxy. He lay, lays this out in the first chapter. That's kind of his whole, that's the, the entirety of his theology is the 17th century Lutherans all got it wrong. Let me fix it for you. <laughs> that's basically what he does in his, the first chapter. Um, but this in some ways is a popularization of some of those same arguments that we find here. Where God Meets Man, uh, Luther's down-to-earth approach to the gospel is the subtitle there. So uh, this, what I'm going to do here is outline, I'm going to read quotes because as as I have critiqued Ferdy and Paulson as well, the, the constant accusation uh, that I get is that I'm mischaracterizing these thinkers. And I certainly don't want to mischaracterize thinkers <laughs> because I don't like it when I mischaracterize them. That happens to me too. It happens to everybody. So I certainly don't, don't want to be doing that. But there are certain groups that seem to be incapable of 
taking a critique without just jumping to you just misunderstand. So uh, a- any claim of misunderstanding uh, I think should be taken seriously. If someone gives you a critique as part of a group and says you don't understand us, yeah, take it seriously and look into it. Um, but sometimes that's just a way to kind of avoid really dealing with the primary issues. And you see this, for example, with critical race theory. Uh, the, those who are proponents of critical race theory uh, are constantly saying anyone who critiques it doesn't understand it. And now, to be clear, there, there, that is one of those terms that's actually just thrown around, around a lot to identify all sorts of things. And, and often there is misunderstanding. But but I've seen people who really have, have delved pretty intensely into the academic texts. You know, I think like Neil Shenvey, I think he's done a good job dealing with a lot of the texts and ideas behind critical race theory. I, I think he understands them accurately. But he's somebody who the proponents just throw out, you don't understand it. You're just a straw man. You're, you're misunderstanding. When in reality, he's like, I mean, the, the guy can quote texts that say exactly the same things that he's saying. So uh, just because someone says misunderstanding does not always mean that's the case. So, but because of that, what I'm going to do is spend most of the time just reading citations so you see it for yourself, so you're not just relying on my interpretation. Again, read the book. Very short, quick read if you want to understand this stuff and, and ask, am I making sense of this or am I completely misinterpreting it? I've read this multiple times. I've read all of these books, because they were a significant part of my dissertation, I've read all of Ferdy's writings many times. I've read, you know, Paulson's earlier writings, not his, his newer ones, because I haven't been doing this as much recently, uh, many times. So, and maybe I'm totally misunderstanding them. But let's see, uh, page nine here of this book, uh, he's talking about the what he calls the ladder scheme. So this is the, the, the this is what he's critiquing. And he's basically building all of his theology on a rejection of what he refers to as the ladder scheme. And he says this on page nine, as human beings, we seem bound uh, somehow to think of the law as a staircase or ladder to to heaven. Uh, We more or less assume most of the time without really thinking very deeply about it, that the law was given as a way to God or salvation. If we could live up to the law, we reason, if we could climb the ladder, we would make it to our goal. So uh, he, what, what he's laying out is uh, by, by nature, uh, in some ways, this sounds like the opinio legis uh, that Luther talks about, the opinion of the law. We, we, by nature, tend to be rather legalistic in our view of salvation, which is true. Uh, we, we tend to think that the law is a ladder to heaven, right? If we do enough good things, we can, we can reach God by, by obedience. Okay, read the, reading that part of Ferdy, that sounds like Luther. That sounds like some pretty obvious basic Lutheran observation. But here is the problem. That um, he's not just talking about self-righteousness here when he's talking about the latter scheme. He's also talking about the essence or nature of the law, even as the law is that which Christ fulfills for us. So what he's not saying is we do not climb the ladder to God by the law because we're sinners. Instead, Christ vicariously satisfies the demands of the law on our behalf. He fulfills the law for us. Uh, the you know demands of God are satisfied in the Son, in the person of Christ. He's not saying that at all. And, and here is where he departs really significantly from classical Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, So he says, the problem is, quote, on page 10, the very idea that the law is a ladder and that God is one who can be bargained with or obligated to, quote, pay off according to such schemes. So he's not just talking about the obedience of sinners. He's saying the law as such is not something that can merit by itself before God. That's the very nature of the law is that it doesn't do that. And the nature of how it is that God operates is simply not according to law. So how God operates is not according to moral standard at all in this sense. Then he has a he has a section here on page 10 called The Gospel Becomes Another Law. Now, what he outlines here is just the classical Lutheran Orthodox view. And really it's a rejection of, it's, it's not just a rejection of Lutheranism. Um, th- this is the Lutheran formulation of what is the Ans- Anselmian tradition in the West. So in in rejecting this, he's rejecting kind of all at least Western views of of atonement coming from the medieval period. Uh, I would say he it even goes back to Athanasius and his language of debt uh, that, that he uses uh, in referring to the death of Christ. And 
what Ferdy's not doing here, what he's not doing is what Al Lane does. As in, he's not saying the Anselmian tradition is too legal uh, and therefore we need a kind of Christus Victor tradition. To We need to use those kind of motifs more, uh, which is what you find in you know, Gustav Aulain, Lutheran, the Lutheran theologian, but which is kind of the view of Eastern Orthodoxy. That's not what he's doing here. What he's rejecting is he, he has this radical view of divine freedom that God does not actually have to operate according to his own moral nature or law, which is why he doesn't need to fulfill the law because he just can save without it at all. Um, and, and this is... Uh, what is the medieval view of, of voluntarism, which shows up within nominalism, uh, which is a, a, an emphasis on divine freedom, uh, divine freedom that is unconstrained in terms of, of the law being an assen the essential nature of God. So let, let me keep uh, reading here to see what else he says, uh, because I, I want to give quotations so you'd see this is not just my interpretation and commentary. So he has a section called, The Gospel Becomes Another Law. Here is what he says. I'm going to read this whole paragraph. Let me explain. We begin by assuming the law is a ladder to heaven. Then we go on to say, of course no one can climb the ladder because we are all weakened by sin. We are all therefore guilty and lost. That would be true. And then he says, and this is where, quote, the gospel uh, and he puts it in quotes as if this isn't actually the gospel. We just call it the gospel, but it's not. Is to enter the picture. What we need is someone to pay our debt to God and to climb the ladder for us. This supposedly is what Jesus has done. As our, subst quote, substitute, <laughs> uh, he has paid off God and climbed the ladder for us. All we have to do now is believe it. So you see in this paragraph, what he's doing is just outlining a basic presentation of how the law and gospel relate to one another in a Lutheran theological context. Um, and, and this isn't large, this, this isn't just Lutheran either. As I said, this is really just kind of Western theology. I mean, this is rejection of Thomas, rejection of certainly re Reformed views as well, but we're dealing with it in a Lutheran context. So he's saying that it is not true that Jesus pays the debt for us on the cross. He's saying that's not true because for Ferdy, that is the latter scheme. Uh, and Paulson is going to borrow this same idea, but he's going to call it the, the the legal scheme in Lutheran theology. He's going to make this. He's going to make essentially the same points here, um, but he calls it the legal scheme. And I've heard some some people have said he doesn't mean by that what Freddie means by ladder scheme, but he's echoing a lot of the same language and talking about God saving without regard to the law at all. I mean, he uses some of the same rejection language of vicarious atonement, though at other times you can kind of talk about a vicarious atonement, but it, com it it's completely redefined. Um, and this is this is a frustration with a lot of, especially kind of post-Bardian theology, that with someone like Bart and the rise of neo-orthodoxy, you, you have the revival of a lot of these orthodox terms, but you always have to ask, what do they actually mean by the orthodox terms? Because very often what is meant is something completely different. So it can sound orthodox because, yeah, I mean, technically it's like some of the same words. But it's you have to ask the broader question, what do you mean by the terms that you're using? Uh, and, and, and Ferdy, I, what I do appreciate about Ferdy, and what I appreciate very much about this particular book, is that he's just very clear. He just, he lays it all out. It's not ambiguous. Um, and, and this isn't hard to understand. I can't say the same about Paulson. Paulson obfuscates a lot. He, he's just very vague in his language. Ferdy's really not. I mean, Ferdy just lays it out. He, he just says, this is what I think. This is or orthodoxy is wrong. Um... You know, he's the, there are errors all over the Bible, Ferdy said. I mean, this is just, he's very, very clear about where he stands on a lot of issues, which, which I appreciate. I appreciate clarity in writing, and, and Ferdy, I think, is rather straightforward, and I appreciate his straightforwardness, which just makes it, to me, all the more baffling that people don't understand what he's saying, because I, he's just very, he just kind of lays it all out as it is. Um, okay, so... He, Ferdy's saying that's wrong. Jesus is not our substitute. Further, this is a denial of the active obedience of Christ. Um, this is, is a denial that Christ has to actually fulfill the law somehow in our place. So there is no passive obedience, death on the cross, paying our debt. There's also no active obedience, Christ actively fulfilling the law on our behalf. There is no necessity for Jesus to do that at all, according to Ferdy. Um, so here is uh, page 11 then. Uh, the net result is that the gospel itself simply becomes another kind of law. So what 
he's, he doesn't see continuity between law and gospel. Right? In classical theology, we see there's a, there's a continuity. The law and gospel are, as opposed to Rome, constant Roman Catholic claims, <laughs> uh, they're not contradictions. They, they are not contradictions in God or something. God does not speak out of both sides of his mouth, as I heard someone say. Um, no, the law and the gospel are both, or they're distinct, uh, and, and their, their effects upon us as sinners are wildly different, <laughs> uh, but they are not contradictory. Because in the gospel itself, it is not a contradiction of the law. Instead, the gospel itself includes the fulfillment of the law. That's what Ferdi is saying is wrong. So he's, he says that it, the gospel itself, in a classical orthodox view, makes it another kind of law. So for Ferdi, it has to be something totally different. There, there's a complete newness in the gospel. Uh, and then, quote, he says, it becomes, the gospel, becomes a, quote, theory about how God has been paid and how Jesus climbed the ladder. If you want to be saved, you must now, quote, believe all that. That is the new law. The gospel is not news, good news anymore. It is merely a kind of information which after a while loses its punch. It loses its character as news. It ceases to be good. It's set, it is a set of truths which one must somehow muster the strength or will to believe. Um, and, no, for, first of all, this is just complete misunderstanding and, and just, I, I don't even think it's a misunderstanding. I think it's just uh, um, a flat out complete mischaracterization. And Paulson does the same thing. There, there's an equation of like this classical view of the law somehow with a belief in some kind of Pelagian or semi-Pelagian free will as if like the two are always connected, which is just not true. Um, but it's easier to dismiss it when you're saying it's all just free will, you have to muster up the strength to believe. Like, okay, I mean, come on, man. The, the Lutheran Orthodoxy doesn't say this. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit grants faith, but the Spirit does grant faith in things that are actual facts. Here is where you get that dichotomy here between theology and proclamation. And this has infected... <laughs> all like so much of Lutheranism. It's infected our preaching. Um, I'm currently going through some homiletics texts, so find ones that I can recommend. And nearly every homiletics text I found in the last 20 years from a Lutheran perspective just uses this, this false dichotomy uh, that there is some kind of contradiction between teaching uh, and, and proclamation. This is based on this, okay? So if you read Ferdi's Theology is for a Proclamation, this is what he's saying, okay? People use this. It's a supposedly, I think it's a homiletics textbook at one of the seminaries. Theology is for Proclamation is a book that is essentially fundamentally based on what Ferdy is saying here, which is that we cannot talk about some objective facts in history and theological truths as the gospel. The gospel has to just be act, so you, you have a distrust of like information, as if information is bad. And for information, he's including things like the vicarious atonement of Jesus. So that's all theory. That's what that's bad. Systematic theology is all theory. We throw out theory. Uh, we throw out, uh, you know, doctrine in any classical sense at all. Um, and he, yeah, he talks about doctrine, but he, I think, redefines what doctrine is. And, and there are, at times, places where he kind of says, okay, it's okay to talk about it some. But doctrine is just a reflection on the proclamation of the speech act. And he makes that very clear in other places too. Um, but so, so here he's saying the gospel is information and the gospel is kind of opposed to information. This is what, this is the heart of Ferdy's ideas here is that there is a rejection of, or a distrust of information or proposition, you know, propositional doctrine and instead, this, the, there has to be an emphasis on the act. So um, this is the, what becomes the speech act. There's a borrowing from John Austin's speech act theory, uh, which we could get into another time, but I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, so, so the gospel cannot just be information about the death of Jesus and what he did in objectively some event in history, but it's what it does to you now through the speech act. This is the same reason why Stephen Paulson doesn't talk about election as something God did in eternity past, but instead for Paulson, election is what God does to you now through the preacher. Election is what the preacher does, which just isn't what scripture says, but, um, but there, something you'll notice about these guys, there is not strong exegetical work at all. I mean, they do not, they, they'll cite proof texts, but there is not 
the, the you know extensive exegetical how does Paul deal with this in Romans three or Romans four? I mean, it, the, the way that these guys deal with scripture is so uh, you know just uncontextual. So I, I think you. you they don't do a lot of dealing with texts that would seem to mitigate against their views. They don't do extent, you know. They're you know, Paulson's not doing a lengthy treatment of, of Ephesians chapter one and what it says about election and how that might pose a challenge to his idea that it's the preacher who elects in preaching, for example. Um, so then he says this. Um, so this is his critique of vicarious atonement. And on page, and I'm only page eleven. I'm at the beginning of this book. I can go through this whole thing with quotes on every page. Um, <laughs> the trouble is that the theology fostered by the latter is not very easy to believe because if one probes beneath the surface, one soon uncovers a number of difficulties. So here he's saying these are problems. He says, in the first place, can we so lightly assume that God is one who can be bought off, quote, even by Jesus? To be sure, that is a crude way of putting it, but that is what the theory amounts to in its most simplistic manifestation. If the question shocks us, they love shocking things, right? We ought to take it as an indication that we cannot really think that way about God at all. All right, what he's saying, he's a nominalist. This is all he's saying. He's a voluntarist. He's saying that uh, God does not actually have to act according to his own justice because God can't be bought off. God's justice can't be, be bought off uh, so that... It's not that God, read Anselm, uh, Credeus Homo, uh, Why God Became Man, uh, and he has this idea that like divine honor is, is uh, infinitely offended by human sin because human sin is an offense against an infinite God. Therefore, the, the dishonor uh, is, is infinite. God's honor must be repaid. It must be restored. That is what Christ does as the infinite, as an infinite person, uh, as in, because he's God. Uh, he comes incarnate, in a human nature in order to satisfy the honor of God. Now, you could talk, you know, Anselm uses the honor language, um, which, you know, I, I know that generally is, is said to just be kind of a, a very medieval way of, of thinking about things. I know that, um, that my friend Matt Fenn, has, is, uh, who has been on this program before, he, he's tried to make an argument that that's not just medieval. Uh, and I would like him to actually come on and talk about that sometime. But... Um, so that there's there's more to it than in Anselm's view, um, but also you have then the reformulation of that. Aquinas has a, a view of this, and, and then the Lutheran Orthodox have a view of this, which is more in terms of satisfying the demands of the divine law. But they're really essentially different ways of expressing the same the same general truth, which is that basically God has to actually be just in forgiving sinners. And so there needs to be payment for sin in order for sinners to be forgiven and for God to be just. Because God does not contradict himself and God does not contradict his own law and God does not contradict his own character. For Ferdy, this is his argument here, Ferdy is saying that God does not need that at all. That God can just basically ignore the law. He can just ignore his justice and just forgive anyway. So God is not bound by his own law. What you've done now is separated God from the law, uh, and this is, Paulson will go over and over again talk about this, that God is not the law. Uh, well, <laughs> first of all, like theologically, what do you mean by that? Uh, b because, yeah, I mean, I don't know how much I want to get into that, but that it leads to a number of problems because scripture is very clear. Um, you know, be perfect as your, your heavenly father is perfect, you know, Jesus says. Uh, our perfection according to the law is a mirror of God's perfection. Why is it that, um, you know, why is it that the law is good is essentially the question behind this. Like, what, uh, what is it that determines what is good? Uh, is it, it, so, in the way that this is framed with someone like William of Ockham, um, the, the basic example that, that he gives is the question of lying. So, why is lying wrong? Well, in, a, in say, Thomas's theology, uh, we would say, well, lying is wrong because like, because God is a source of good, and all that is good and right is that which reflects God. So, why is lying wrong? Because God doesn't lie. Okay, so, so lying, there is something inherent, in other words, about lying that makes it wrong, because God is the source of all that is good, right, and true. And so, we, we shouldn't 
lie because God doesn't lie, and therefore lying lying is inherently good because it reflects God's character. And all of the laws are like this, because well, what is the law? The law is a human reflection. It is a reflection of God's own eternal nature. Uh, so, is God the law? Well, yes, in that the law is an analogous manner of speaking about God's moral character. Um, but but that's also but is God also gracious? Yes. Uh, but these are also analogical predications, and that kind of depth in conversation certainly is going to show up in Paulson. But th these are analogical predications. What I mean by that is when we when we predicate anything of God, we are using it analogically and not perfectly and exactly. There there is nothing that we can say in human language about God at all that has an exact correspondence to the manner in which it is true of God. So, for example, if I say that, uh, if I say that God is, say God is, um, is loving, right? Or God is love is what John says, but say God is loving. Well, that, that's true. Uh, well, what is my human conception of love? Uh, well, my human conception of love is, is pretty much defined by my own human interactions with other humans and how we love one another. Now, I can, uh, I can kind of imagine in some way a love that is that is beyond what I have in my ordinary human relationships, and and so in that way I can I can grasp what it is that God is love. But do I fully really know what it means that God is love in, in the fullest sense? No, of course not, uh, because God's love is is beyond what I can possibly comprehend. It is not just the kind of love that humans have, but just like a little better or a lot better. It, it, it's of a different kind. So human love is is analogous. It's a human analogy to what is really and actually true about God. So the same thing is true about God's law. So is God the law? Yes. Uh, God is the law. God God is the moral good. The, there is no moral good that is not God. <laughs> there, there, there's no separate law that God himself has to you know, align himself with outside of himself. Or there is not a law that is something that God just kind of, kind of creates uh, apart from himself. No, but the law is a revelation of who God actually is in his moral character. Does that mean that the law um, is, is completely comprehensive of who God is? No, because it's analogous language, so it's imperfect. So, uh, if we're talking about moral character, we're not talking about, say, the grace of God. Uh, and, and that's just the nature of how human language and analogy works. But I can say God is the law in the same way that I can say God is grace or God is, is loving or God is good. Because those things are all true. And none of those terms is comprehensive for God. But they are all true, analogously as true propositional statements to refer to uh, God's, God's character, though not comprehensive. We have a distinction here between uh, archetypal and ectypal theology, um, that the archetypal theology is God's own self-knowledge, which is really comprehended in one singular thought that God has of himself that is perfect and comprehensive. We don't get that. We don't understand what that means because we are not God. If God is infinite, only an infinite intellect can understand infinity. <laughs> okay, so we're not going to understand him totally. But our finite minds, in our finite minds, we have this, this um, ectypal theology, which is a reflection of God's self-knowledge, that often comes out in a composite way. So, the way that I understand God is that he is, yeah, he is wrathful and he is loving. Well, I understand those as two distinct attributes. In the fullness of who God is, they're not distinct attributes because God is God and 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 he's not made up of, of composed of these these variety of parts um, so but the law is that kind of reflection of God's character his moral character that we have and understand as humans okay there's an, an aside but that aside is kind of the central issue <laughs> so so it matters a lot so for the voluntarist someone like Occam would say well, why is lying wrong? He would answer that very differently. He would say, because God said so. Um, not because there's this kind of radical freedom in God that he just determines what is right and true. And you have this kind of radical will, freedom that, you know, in the Enlightenment kind of is kind of transported from Occam's view of God to now us. <laughs> and we're all just radical free creatures and that defines who we are because this kind of radical freedom becomes the definition of 
of nearly everything, which is a hot mess. But uh, we'll leave that question aside. Uh, the the point here is that what what Ferdy is doing is basically adopting what you find with William of Ockham and his voluntarist approach, that God does not actually have to satisfy his own justice. God is defined by his own freedom to do whatever he wants, regardless of his own consistency or character. All right. So let's, uh, you see that here, page 11. Um, then he's, I mean, here he just sounds like, you know, every other liberal theologian. Uh, I mean, Ferdy's in the ELCA. Uh, you, know, you get the same silly critiques you get of vicarious atonement from all over the place within liberal theology. Um, okay, here on page 12, he, you know, how? here's the question. The second place, to introduce the question of payment in this way inevitably raises the old question of how can we be sure that Christ has paid enough? Can the suffering and death of one man atone for the sins of the whole world? <sighs> Ferdy. Anselm arg answered this argument in so much depth. Uh, it, it, come on. Like, this is, this is, when you read these kind of things, you're like, come on, really? Really? We're going back to this? And, and like, this is the kind of argument that all the liberal theologians who are offended by vicarious atonement throw out. And, um, yeah. So, why is it that one man can, can suffer for the sins of the world? Well, because that one man is also there's the incarnation, right? He's the infinite logos who has united himself uh, hypostatically to, you know, human nature. So there's one person, uh, though in the death of Christ, therefore you have, first of all, an innocent man suffering. So he's not suffering for his own sins. So therefore his, his suffering is, is for the sake of others. Uh, but also you have the infinity of God united to his nature. So therefore uh, the infinity of God means that the payment of God can be infinite because God is infinite. That, that's kind of how this whole thing works. Okay, so uh, it, it's and a lot of this, you know, the, the logical puzzle that supposedly this causes, because that's all this is. Uh, I mean, ultimately, you just you'd look at the, the text of Scripture, right? Because this is you could deal with the philosophical question, which again Anselm answers the philosophical question very adequately, uh, and, and this has been repeated, you know, ad nauseum. But really, you've got to deal with the text. Well, what does the text say? What do the texts about atonement say? I mean, Romans 3 talks about God being both just and justifier through the death of Christ. Because that's kind of the point, is that he's, he justifies us, but he has to be just in himself because he has to satisfy the demands of the law. Um, you know, we see the language in Colossians of him, you know, canceling the record of debt that stood against us under the law because Christ took the dead upon himself. So you got to deal exegetically with all of these various passages. And you've got the whole Old Testament background. Um, if you guys really want me to do something on the atonement, I could go through, and I've done a little bit with Junius Remen Snyder's book on the atonement. Um, it's a book that we publish. If you want a classical, great biblical treatment of the atonement, uh, which deals with a lot of liberal critiques. Junius Remenstider's uh, The Atonement in Modern Theology is excellent. It's a really excellent book. And the, the, the answers that he has apply very clearly to Ferdy, except the guys that Remenstider was dealing with were a lot more sophisticated in their argumentation. But um, you could find that at jspublishing.org. That's a book that, that we put out. It's a really excellent volume. And I've thought about doing a series of programs on the atonement going through pieces of that book because I think it's it's extremely helpful um, in, in just the exegetical answers to some of those questions. And he does deal with the theological answers to the, some of these dilemmas as well, but largely it really is just delving into uh, the text. B.B. Warfield actually wrote the foreword to that, which is interesting um, as a Reformed guy. But, but a lot of the, I mean, as much as the Reformed and Lutheran views on certainly in the extent of the atonement are pretty distinct, uh, you know, there a lot of the battles they're fighting are pretty are against the same kind of issues. Uh, all right. In the third place, and here's the third major critique, how will we ever deal with this? Uh, there is the troublesome question of forgiveness. If God has been paid, how can one say that he really forgives? If a debt is paid, one can hardly say it is forgiven, nor could one call God's action mercy. So he's saying if the only way that forgiveness is actually forgiveness or if mercy is actually forgiveness is if God does not satisfy the demands of his own law. But what he's basically saying is it's only in the voluntarist nominalist system that mercy is actually mercy. 
you know, by what standard, like, how are you coming to this conclusion? I mean, from, from what? It certainly doesn't logically make sense. Um, if I, you know, think of a, a human example, um, if someone, say, owes, owes me a major debt, uh, and, you know, I need that money that this person is supposed to owe me to, say, pay my mortgage this month. Uh, if the person does not have the money and I instead take, say, funds out of my own account and say, don't worry about it. I'll take care of the debt. I'll pay the mortgage payment and you're forgiven. Would that not be a gracious act? Like that wouldn't be gracious because it was paid? Or if someone else said that they would pay it for him, the debt, that, that wouldn't be gracious? Like, it, it just doesn't even make sense in a human logical sense, let alone the scriptural text. <sighs> all right. So, here is, then we get what, so with all of this, we then have to ask the question, what the heck is the law in the first place? And this is something you find frustrating with Paulson, with his book, The Outlaw God. It's like he uses the phrase law like 10 times a page, but never defines what the law is. And when you start to see him, def like, saying that, you know, classical metaphysics is the law or this is the law, like things that clearly are not just the law. So, like, what is he using the term to actually mean? It, it can be very confusing. Uh, and th this is a major place where I say that you have to look at definitions. What are they using the word to mean? What is law? What is gospel? Because if you just say law and gospel, that sounds Lutheran, but what the heck is the law and what the heck is the gospel? Because you could be defining them in completely different ways that are totally disconnected from scripture and our tradition. And that's exactly what Ferdy does here. So, uh, he talks about the, the heading of the section is the voice that never ends. So, the, the law is basically, he's, what he's going to do is describe the law as a voice of accusation toward you. So, he says this. For Luther, he imports all of this into Luther, which is its own issue, but I'm not dealing with the Luther scholarship part of things. For Luther, the crucial question was not so much what the law says, i.e. the information it contains. It's, it's weird, you know? Like, the... God spent so much time on information about what the law was. I mean, you got chapters and chapters and chapters. I mean, you got a whole five books called the Pentateuch that's a bunch of laws. What was God doing? I don't think Moses got the distinction between theology and proclamation. I mean, come on, Moses, what are you doing? So, you know, he just... Uh, let, let's keep reading. <laughs> okay, so... So it's not so much the information it contains, but instead, but what it actually does to you when you hear it. That is why Luther puts so much stress on the question of the uses of the law. The question is one of how the law is intended to be used, what it is actually supposed to do. What he worked out was the doctrine of two uses of the law. He's rejecting, rejecting the third use of the law here. Um, and then he says, it seems that Luther never spoke of a third use of the law, which he calls the law to guide Christian living, even though Melanchthon and others did. Okay, so he's, he's saying Luther didn't believe in the third use of the law. Um, plenty of stuff has been done on that. Engelbrecht has a book on, uh, what's, what's it called? Friends of the Law? Is that what it's called? Uh, on Luther's third use of the law. Uh, so then he goes on to say, page 14, the law is not in that sense a ladder to heaven. That would make the law into a theory and theology, as we have seen. Likewise, into a theory about how it is satisfied. So you get this false dichotomy of the doing and the ideas behind the doing or the theory. In its theological use, and here's the key here, law should be understood as a concrete and actual voice which sounds in the heart and the conscience, a real voice which afflicts man in his isolation from God and demands that he fulfill his humanity. So it's the... it's. What he does is existentializes the law, and I've referred to Ferdy as an existential Lutheran. Uh, what I don't mean is that, you know, he just borrows Sartre and just totally reformulates his ideas and, and, and repackages them in law gospel terminology. But I think the, the influences of an existentializing are very, I think it's very clear. He even uses quotes, parts, uh, fart, <laughs> Sartre, and maybe maybe that uh, was not an accidental, I don't know, maybe it's subconscious how we think about Sartre, uh, which would be, I guess, be, be accurate. But uh, so he... Uh, he cites Sartre, he says, no exit. The law declares no exit. He says it's like a circle around you, which is one of his, uh, his existentialist plays. So he, he does use some existentialist 
uh, terminology purposefully here. Uh, and so when I say existentialist, I have people critique and say, well, he's not like he doesn't agree with existentialists on this, this, and this. Well, I, yeah, I know. That's that, that's not the point. <laughs> okay, the, the point is um, what he is doing is in some major way in terms of how he defines the law in the gospel, he's really defining it as a voice that creates this dreadful existential state rather than the good and eternal immutable will of God, which is how our, uh, the Lutheran confessions define the law. Uh, so classically, there's a distinction that in his law, Freddie's law gospel debate, he, he's explicit in saying this distinction is wrong. I mean, he goes through the history of orthodoxy and says this is a wrong distinction. Um, and, and this is maybe the, the key to to the issue here, is that Ferdy will say so. Cla- or, sir, well, let the distinction first. So classically, there is a distinction between um, the essence of the law and the office of the law. Uh, the essence of the law is what the law is. That's the moral commands of God. So the law in and of itself is good, and in and of itself it is a reflection of, of God's nature and his moral character. The office of the law is that the law accuses. Uh, do, is the law by nature accusation? Of course not, because it's just moral standards. The office of the law in regard to sinners is accusation, but the problem is not the law, that it's by nature accusation. The problem is that we are, are sinners, so we, we make the law accuse us because of our sin. So it's not that the law's essence is accusation, but it does have the office of accusing sinners because of our sin. What Ferdy says is that's a wrong distinction. He says, like he sees basically Lutheran orthodoxy kind of went way off the rails when it it made that distinction. So for Ferdy, instead, it's the law is the accusation. The essence of the law is the office of the law. So the law is by nature that which accuses. Uh, so here I've got another quote here where he says this. Uh, and I've got two quotes. This is on page 15 of this book. The law is not merely a set of commandments, not a list of requirements that could be disposed of merely by doing a few things and checking them off. So he's not even, again, this is very dismissive you know, language to try to make it sound absurd. The, the idea that Christ could fulfill the law for us is something totally absurd. Uh, the law is that, would, quote, this is what he says here, that immediate and actual voice, so it's this kind of, voice from God that has this existential effect. This immediate and actual voice arising from the sum total of human experience. And you're like, this definition, how does this have anything to do with like how, like the Ten Commandments? Like how does this have anything to do with how law is used in Paul? I I just don't see how you do this. Uh, Okay, so in this age, up to and including the cross, a voice which will not stop until our humanity is fulfilled. Is a voice that man can never stop in this life. Um, okay. And then he uses Melanchthon's quote, uh, uh, the law always accuses, like Semper Cusat, but he's not meaning it just in this, like Melanchthon's statement is based on this distinction that he makes between essence and office of the law, which he's rejecting here. Okay, then he says, on the bottom of page 15, it is important to grasp what is meant here if we are to avoid the latter idea. The law is not defined only as a specific set of demands as such, but rather in terms of what it does to you. Um, Law is that which accuses and terrifies in a real sense. Now, here is where I think this is is key, because sometimes you can read this and say, well, all he's doing is saying that... uh, Because he does say, you know, the law is not only defined as a specific set of commands. So he's saying, is he saying that He's just saying that the also the you know office of the law is also part of what the law means. L- look at this here. What he says here, anything that does this function is law. So it is it is that which is law is that which brings about this existential kind of situation, this inner kind of voice of accusation toward you. Uh, so he says, law, the law is not a ladder to heaven. It is the mark of man's existence in this age. From the rustling of the leaves to the agony of the cross, it is the voice which for the sinner never ends. Uh, and he takes this, uh, Werner Ehlert grabs onto the statement of Luther, where Luther talks about the rustling of leaves. And this, it, it, that even something little like that can be this kind of reminder of God's power and and. As sinners, we can we can see God's power and experience a kind of dread brought about by you know by that kind of uh, you know noise that we hear. That could be this this reminder of God's wrath in some significant way. So that that's what he's he's talking about here. 
Um, which, yeah, it, there, there's nothing wrong with this kind of speaking if you are tying that to this eternal law that is the immutable, unchanging will of God. But what Ferdy has done is kind of, he's, he's taken the objective ground out from under all of this because he said God, God does not actually have to you know, obey his own law. The law doesn't actually have to be fulfilled. The law certainly can be commands, and he's saying it's tied with commands. So he's not saying commands are, are, are not the law in any sense. But he does say that's really what the law is. If we're talking about law in the fullest sense, it's just whatever accuses. It's whatever brings that voice of accusation uh, to us. So it's that the function of the law becomes the essence of the law. It is that which accuses. That's definitional to what the law is. And it's a voice, further, that is only in this age as sinners. It's not eternal. Then we have uh, statements about the gospel, because if that's true about the law, and, and what he's saying is the gospel is not the vicarious atonement of Christ. It's not this historical event where God satisfies the demands of the law in Christ's uh, life, death, and resurrection. Then what the heck is the gospel in the first place? Okay, so then he says in uh, page 16, uh, okay, he says, if we look at the law in this way, we can begin to grasp the dynamic vitality, the good news character of the gospel. For the gospel too must be seen in terms of what it does. For what is the gospel? This is the definition of the gospel. Now, to be clear, we have a biblical definition of the gospel. Paul, Paul writes this to the Corinthians, the 1 Corinthians 15. He says, this is what I delivered unto you. And he defines the gospel. It's the objective events of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. That's the gospel. It's the good news, what Jesus actually did. It, it, it exists totally apart from you. It has nothing to do with your existence or anything that God is doing specifically in your life or in your conscience. It, it, it soothes the conscience, but it is in itself a historical reality of the justification of the world by Christ through his life, death, and resurrection. That's what the gospel is. But remember, Ferdy is operating on this strong dichotomy between that. That's all information, and what we need is act, what's done to you. So, for what is the gospel? Here's the definition of the gospel here. It is the end of the law. Okay? Um, that is to say that what the gospel does is put an end to the voice of the law. And that means actually to put a stop to it, to shut it up, to make it no longer heard. So what we're saying here, that, that the law is this kind of inner accusatory voice. It is the, this, this kind of existential dread that we have in some way. And the gospel is that which puts an end to that accusing voice. So, then he says, the gospel, too, is defined primarily by what it does. This is key. The gospel comforts because it puts an end to the voice of the law. This is exactly what happens when you get rid of the eternal nature of God's law. Is now the, the atonement is not really the place where salvation occurs, because the gospel is that which comes to you in your life, not an objective reality of what Christ did in his life. It, it all becomes very, very much kind of subjectivized. Um, so, it, it is, he says this, it is an entirely new and unexpected thing that breaks into man's life and world. The voice for man as sinner never ends, is stopped by God's action in Christ. An entirely new kind of life breaks upon us. <sighs> okay. So, what, what he has is this kind of complete uh, discontinuity between law and gospel. Some of this is from uh, J.C.K. von Hoffman, who he's, bar he's borrowing from, who's a theologian at Erlingen. Um, though he deals with it more redemptive historically, and, and Ferdy does this more existentially, but that's a, a major influence on Ferdy's uh, thought here. But, so what he's, what he's saying here is essentially that there is this total re, you know, kind of... Um, a total abandonment kind of, of law with the gospel. Uh, he, he's constantly talking about don't put new wine into old wineskins, as in the gospel cannot include for, in it the fulfillment of the law because the gospel has to be something actually totally new. So the law is something old, new creation begins, it just gets rid of the law altogether. So you have this radical, uh, this age, the age to come, total discontinuity be between the two, which is very similar to what Boltman does in, in his reading of Paul. Um, okay. Okay. 
Then he says this, let's see, the, the gospel is the story of him who shattered the grammar of the earth. So every, you're going to see, we're talking about grammar. Everything with Ferdy is about the, the speech, the proclamation. Now, he's not really going to use the speech act language. That's more uh, Oswald Bayer. But the proclamation idea is pretty much the same kind of thing that Bayer's getting at. I don't really see any fundamental difference other than Bayer is um, a much better better scholar and is much more rigorous in the way that he uses his philosophical terminology. Uh, Byers a very, uh, is very intelligent and very, I disagree with him profoundly on a number of issues, but but I think his, uh, as as a scholar and and thinker, he's kind of, I think, leagues above where, where Ferdy really is on a lot of these issues. Um, so, uh, but, but essentially they're coming to the same, the same uh, conclusion here. So he, but but it's all about grammar. It's all about speech. So everything is just speech. Now the the problem with all of this, which is, should be pretty kind of pretty obvious when you just think through this a little bit, is what is the point of the death of Jesus? Because when when law is just voice of accusation, God doesn't need to satisfy the law. God can just freely forgive, and the gospel is just that which brings an end to the voice of accusation. And if the gospel is, is really just defined in how what it does to you personally, what's the what's the whole Jesus thing about? It doesn't even matter because now you've you've taken pulled the rug under the you know Jesus's death and, and resurrection. So those things aren't necessary because God can just kind of do what what He wants with this pure voluntarism. God can just forgive anyway. So why? Why do we ha even have the death of Jesus? And, and that's why these guys aren't going to want to say there's no necessity in the death of Jesus. And, and he, he'll try to explain it in in bizarre ways. And he, I think he can't really do it, which should show you the error of his theology. If you can't say that the death of Jesus was necessary, which is kind of the entire point of Christianity. So like I'm getting fired up here, but like, yeah, that's the whole point. This is the whole Jesus thing. This is what Christianity is. If, if you're, what you're doing is making the very central thing of the entirety of Christianity have essentially no function or purpose and don't know what to do with it, maybe you should go back and rethink some of your uh, theological conclusions if, if that's where you're, you're coming. And I think that's the inevitable result of, of what, what he does. So the gospel then becomes not about Jesus, not in, his, not in any historical sense of his life, death, and resurrection. It just becomes about what it does to you. So you can hear a new grammar that you are forgiven because you're not hearing demand anymore. You're hearing something that the voice of demand has stopped. It's just everything is, this is why for Paulson, it's the preacher, the preacher, the preacher, the preacher. Every single thing you'll ever hear from Paulson is just the preacher does this, the preacher does that, the preacher does that. Because all of salvation is reduced to a singular momentary speech act which is the absolution. That's all there is to the theology, is just the absolution. Everything, all fundamental aspects of Christianity are kind of subsumed under the word of absolution, and that's it. Uh, all right, so uh, let's see. I'm going to read just quickly two more things in this chapter, and this is only the first chapter. Okay, so um, the gospel, he broke the grammar of the earth, and who broke open the closed circle of the voice of the law and gave us the gift of hope. So closed circle language is purposeful. And so he's saying the law is not a ladder that leads to heaven. Instead, it's a circle. It's basically that which is just a, a circle that surrounds you with accusation. You're stuck in there and you can't get away from accusation because that's what the law does. So the gospel comes in not to fulfill that, but to break you out of the circle. Uh, and the circle says, later he says, no exit from Sark. Um, all right, so then he says, Luther understood the gospel as something more than a theory about how God might or might not have been bought off up there in heaven. If it were only that, it would just be another law. This is the thing that gets so frustrating is these guys talk about everything as if all classical theology is just law. This is law. That's law. This is law. The implication, of course, is law is bad. And if I call something law, that means it's bad. I mean, that, that's... That's the mode of argument because that's the, the depth of uh, brilliant argumentation and scholarship you get with some of these guys, uh, which is endlessly frustrating. But okay, uh, so then it would merely be a set of doctrines to which the command would be added, thou shalt believe this or perish. It, this just like, this is what's so frustrating about, and I've made this point about these guys before. You know, I deal with a lot of, uh, you know, Roman Catholic um, apologists who I think totally mischaracterize Lutheranism and, and Luther. When you read Ferdy, 
it, it's as if Ferdy is is the guy who listens to the Roman Catholic like total mischaracterizations of everything Luther said, and every time says, "Okay, I'm, I believe that." Yeah, whatever you mischaracterize me as, yeah, I believe that. <laughs> like, it's like if you take someone like you know Eck, and uh, instead of believing Luther's interpretation of Luther, you believe Eck's interpretation of Luther, but also think that's good. It's it's really, uh, I think, very odd. So, like, no, historic Lutheran orthodoxy does not say belief is an act of your free will and you just need to believe a set of facts. Like, this is the mischaracterization that, that Roman Catholics just throw out all the time. And Ferdy does the same thing. Okay. Um, so, then just the final paragraph here the, of, of this chapter in page 17. The battle, therefore, is between these contending voices or powers. So there are these voices that speak to you. There's the voice of accusation and the voice of stopping the accusation. That is why the basic question for Luther was the proper distinction between law and gospel. It is a question of how you hear the words, what they actually do to you. All right. So there we go. There's Ferdy. I think, like, I mean, there's so much more in this book to, to go through. This is just the first 17 pages. But, uh, and I, the fact is, I know I could cite Ferdy. Like, I did this the, the other day. I cited Paulson word for word, and someone was like, that's a mischaracterization of what Paulson says. And I said, here's, you know, page quote. Like, this is what he says. <laughs> like, I, I, it's a, so if I quote the guy, it's mischaracterization. I don't know what to say. Um, but, Hopefully, you kind of get what the issues are here. Like, this is not an insignificant problem. Uh, this is really a problem with uh, pretty foundational matters. So, um, I don't want to do a lot on this, to be honest. It's something I've visited, I've done a lot on, I've written a lot on, I've talked a lot on, um, and, you know, my my views on this have... have um, had significant negative consequences uh, upon my own efforts to an ability to publish with certain journals and publishing houses and speak at certain events that I have been canceled at because I would dare disagree with these guys and it's all weird politics and and I I, I dealt with that for a long time and I just was like I just I, I didn't want to particularly dive into this debate because of that but now that it's come up again and um, I've seen numerous you know professors go after me on Facebook about not understanding Paulson, who also have admitted they haven't actually listened to or read anything I've said, which seems to be a consistent pattern. Um, I thought, uh, fine, I'll delve into it again. So hope you found this worth it. Uh, and uh, make sure that you subscribe on YouTube and on the podcast app. And uh, you know, I, I would like to do something on Paulson and read some quotes as well, because it's probably necessary. Um, let me know if you want me to do that. We'll see you in the next one. God bless.